In our day, certain economic truths have become accepted as self-evident. A second Bill of Rights, under which a new basis of security and prosperity can be established for all, regardless of station or race or creed. Among these are the right to a useful and remunerative job, the right to earn enough to provide adequate food and clothing and recreation, the right of every farmer to raise and sell his products at a return which will give him and his family a decent living, the right of every businessman, large and small, to trade in an atmosphere of freedom, freedom from unfair competition and domination by monopolies at home or abroad, the right of every family to a decent home, the right to adequate medical care, and the opportunity to achieve and enjoy good health, the right to adequate protection from the economic fears of old age, sickness, accidents, and unemployment, the right to a good education. All of these rights spell security. And after this war is won, we must be prepared to move forward in the implementation of these rights to new goals of human happiness and well-being. For unless there is security here at home, there cannot be lasting peace in the world. Bonita Bandera, what a beautiful flag by Romito. This is Democracy Now!, democracynow.org. That song was adopted by Chicago's national office as the Young Lords National Anthem. I'm Amy Goodman with Juan Gonzalez. Well, we end the show with a look back at the Young Lords, a radical group founded by Puerto Ricans modeled on the Black Panther Party in late July of 1969. The group staged their first action in an effort to force the city of New York to increase garbage pickups in East Harlem. The Young Lords would go on to inspire activists around the country as they occupied churches and hospitals in an attempt to open the spaces to community projects. Uh, the group called for self-determination for all Puerto Ricans, for independence for the island of Puerto Rico, community control of institutions and land, freedom for all political prisoners, and the withdrawal of U.S. troops from Vietnam. 
uh, Puerto Rico and other areas. The Young Lords would also play a pivotal role in spreading awareness of Puerto Rican culture and history. While the group disintegrated it by the mid-1970s, its impact is still felt today. The Young Lords is the focus of a new art exhibit that's organized by the Bronx Museum of the Arts, called Presente, the Young Lords in New York. It's on view at three different cultural institutions here in New York. Tonight, our very own Juan González, who served as the group's first minister of education, will host the first in a series um, of programs hosted by the King Juan Carlos Center at New York University, called Latinos and Modern U.S. Society, a series of public conversations. This evening's discussion includes our guest Johanna Fernandez, as well as Darrow Anzor Serrano, uh, Iris Morales and Mickey Melendez. We're joined by Johanna Fernandez, co-curator of Presente, The Young Lords in New York. She's professor of history at Brute College, CUNY, and author of the forthcoming book, When the World Was Their Stage, A History of the Young Lords Party, 1968-76, to with Princeton University Press. Welcome back to Democracy Now! Thank you. But I want to start with Juan. Juan, uh, given you were the first minister of information of the Young Lords, there's a resurgence of interest in the Young Lords. Uh, what, four decades later? Why do you think that is? And why did you and a group of um, young Puerto Ricans decide to found the Young Lords? Uh, well, it is kind of surprising that, that there is so, so this, uh, this resurgence in the last few years, not only of, uh, of these, uh, the exhibitions, but of scholarly works like Johanna's and Daryl Wanza Serrano's and others that are coming up from academics and, uh, and even uh, political interests. Uh, last year, the City Council of New York renamed the street, where we took over the first uh, People's uh, the Spanish Methodist Church, the People's Church in 1969, renamed that street uh, Young Lord Way. Mm -hmm. So there's, uh, it's, it's, it kind of, it is kind of baffling <laughs> that so many years later you'd have this kind of interest uh, in an organization that for years was sort of overlooked and not uh, uh, ever since it fell apart uh, by the mid 1970s. Can we go back for a minute to a clip of you actually from Third World Newsreel uh, from the film El Pueblo se levanta, the people are rising. Here because you have a big church, because you are Christian. Because this church is not open at all during the week. And what we ask you for is for space. That's all. We will supply the manpower. We will supply the food for the children. All we ask is for the space of this church and this community. Now, we don't think that you people are our enemies. We do think that the reverend who called the police in, who has had the police here every day since we've been here and would not allow us to speak, that that reverend is an enemy. And he's not a Christian. He may be a reverend, but he is not a Christian because he does not serve the poor people and he does not help the poor people in this community. So many people in close to the epicenter of COVID here in New York City had loved ones that either passed away or lost their jobs. Instead of depending on a federal government that abandoned many of us, we had to support each other. And the Congresswoman's campaign, it served as a space where people could collectively uh, kind of work together to find solutions. People needed virtual homework help. We started partnering and made a call out to teachers, to high school students, to parents themselves that had an hour a week to you know, support their neighbor's students. I'm a speech language pathologist for the Department of Education, and I've been volunteering with Team AOC's Homework Helpers Program. With the Homework Helpers Program, I've begun working with an amazing group of individuals committed to providing personalized homework help to children in our community. We're asking for one hour a week for four weeks to make a key impact in the child's life. Please consider becoming a homework helper today. Welcome, welcome once again to the Radical Imagination. I'm your host, Jim Vredos. I'm a sociologist who's taught at John Jay College of Criminal Justice and Yeshiva University here in New York City. $1.9 trillion American Rescue Plan couldn't have come soon enough for tens of millions of desperate Americans and for the recovery of the economy. It's the largest anti-poverty bill in a generation. Almost 14 million Americans, including 5.7 million children, will be lifted out of poverty. The child tax credit alone will cut child poverty by half. It also shows how the American economy really works, how people really prosper and move up the economic ladder. 
kills the American dream for the myth it is. A dream rooted in a legacy of discrimination and privilege. A dream set up on an unequal playing field that for many becomes impossible to overcome even through heroic individual efforts. That's especially true for children. Their life chances are overwhelmingly dependent on the income and education level of their parents. And of course, children choose their parents. Most Americans have never moved up by a trickle down supply side, rising tide, lifting all boats economics, where money and tax breaks get thrown at corporations and billionaires. That approach assures economic prosperity for the rich. Building the economy up from the middle and bottom does enable every American to benefit. With the stress of a global pandemic, lack of federal and local funding for school districts, and the children of poor and working class families falling behind on their remote learning, a remarkable new and empowering plan has been developed by Congresswoman Alexandra Ocasio-Cortez and her campaign. The Homework Helper Program helps students by providing them with up to one hour of free online tutoring per week. The virtual program enlists volunteer tutors and expert educators from all over the country and hopes to serve 1,000 students in AOC's district during the school year. Furthermore, it can easily serve as a model in communities across the country to help all kids who are struggling. Attempts to empower and organize local families and their children by the campaign are reminiscent of the breakfast programs and early education initiatives of the Black Panthers and Young Lords in the 1960s and 70s. The real test whether these initiatives will become, will become permanent and embedded in what Franklin Roosevelt called for in his 1944 Second Bill of Rights speech, an economic bill of rights encoded and guaranteed by federal law. That still remains the unfinished business of American social democracy, and no amount of trickle-down will bring it about. We're thrilled to welcome today to the Radical Imagination two organizers and activists who understand the devastating long-term impacts systematic inequities can have on a child's life. Jonathan Soto is an activist and community organizer who served as a policy director in various organizations and dedicated physical and economic rehabilitation of communities affected by Hurricane Sandy. He's been the director for the Bronx Clergy Roundtable, where he helped communities of faith with various organizing efforts and youth mentoring programs. A graduate of Fordham and Brooklyn Law School, Jonathan has been a key political organizer for the AOC Campaign for Congress create homework helper program. Amanda Tercios is a political organizer in the Bronx who's been an outreach volunteer tutoring in the homework helper program since September. She's a graduate of Eurasinus College with a BA in anthropology and sociology and a concentration in Latin American studies. So welcome Jonathan and Amanda, thank you so very, very much for being on the show. And let's discuss this important uh, new initiative that, as I try to say in the opening, really goes back so many years and decades into struggles that we are still grappling with in America. Um, FDR's call for a second economic bill of rights the activism of the 60s, including the Panthers, the Young Lords. Um, this seems to feel like and is a continuation of that struggle, correct? And, and tell us a little bit how this program got started and your participation in it. Uh, thank you so much for the opportunity to be here and welcome to your audience, Radical Imagination. And thank you, Amanda, also for joining us. Uh, again, Jonathan Soto. Um, I am an organizer for the uh, Congresswoman's campaign, also a public school parent in the Bronx, and started seeing the massive impacts of 
COVID also on our educational system that continued exacerbating the inequities that exist. Um, part of my engagement with organizing, especially on schools, uh, happened immediately after, you know, Superstorm Sandy, but also in Puerto Rico, uh, where we saw that the state began to retreat when there was crisis and chaos, and people had to come together to not only meet their needs um, in a way that was mutual and collective, but at the same time, organize through political organization so that these efforts don't just stay volunteer, but become embedded and shape uh, programming that can emerge. So after, after COVID started just exacerbating the district, we saw one of the highest impacts in the country um, in the Congresswoman's district, both in the Bronx and Queens. Um, as a public school parent, I saw the massive alienation, the uh, huge systemic failures um, that were impacting not only like my student, my daughter, uh, but also many of her peers. We know that these inequities emerge, especially in times of crisis. And what we did is uh, we made a call out. You know, the Congresswoman um, not only has a vast network, uh, but is very clear about the need to support one another in a sense of collectivity and mutuality. We then started seeing over 13,000 people that had signed up uh, to support, to provide homework help. And since September, um, we've been connecting tutors, one-on-one uh, -on -one homework help. Also, we started connecting and doing small group courses. And parents and guardians are really, really engaging with this. Uh, we're seeing that it's addressing not only many of the um, inequities, uh, the lack of attention, the lack on one-on-one -on -one engagement many students have, but at the same time is having key social-emotional impacts. Uh, people are expressing um, creating new relationships, but also understanding about different topics and curriculums that they may not have otherwise engaged in. So, for example, we are partnering uh, with a racial justice literacy group called uh, Start Lighthouse uh, to provide racial justice literacy and engagement um, to students that may otherwise not see themselves reflected in curriculum. Uh, we're providing uh, food uh, and cooking courses, but at the same time providing meals for families. Um, providing social distancing training uh, to students through online games like Roblox. So it's, it's fascinating to see, um, but it cannot stay volunteer. Uh, we need to make sure that these uh, programs and initiatives and tutoring uh, become not only embedded, as you mentioned, in our public and social safety networks, but pushing so that, you know, we don't have to do this on a volunteer basis. But for example, um, we could have and UBI uh, or a, a guaranteed median income, let's say, uh, for let's say volunteers that decide to tutor. There's a lot of conversation around how this programming can take place. Uh, but one of the most important things is that we want to focus on enrichment as opposed to achievement. The achievement standards, as we've seen with standardized tasting, is alienating. Uh, primarily uh, negatively impacts black and brown communities. So we want to emphasize the enrichment part of this. Um, so our goal is to connect to 1,000 students by the end of June, which we are on track on. We're going to develop a toolkit so that different people through different communities are able to create their own homework helper programs um, with guidance from us and also advocate that, you know, there should be federal funding uh, for uh, homework helper programs at the local level that center um, and that are directly tied to the communities and not the standardized achievement based models that we see that exist oftentimes in different spaces. Right. Uh, let's we'll, we'll, we'll get back to that enrichment uh, issue that you were talking about mentioned. But Amanda, how did you get involved in the program? Um, yeah. So, hi, everybody. My name is Amanda. Right. I'm really happy to be here today. So, Jonathan Hello. actually Hello. told me about the program back in September um, because we worked together on the Semeles Lopez campaign. And he reached out to me and he was like, hey, we're going to start a new program that offers free homework help to students in your district. Like, do you want to join? And I was like, yes, of course. You know, I've had um, so many jobs with kids in the past. And I just finished college in May, so I really wanted to like make sure that my time was being productive. So um, I've been doing this for over six months and I've been an organizer and a tutor. So I currently tutor three little kids. Um, I tutor a first grader and two fourth graders and they're super sweet, I love them. And I'm also an organizer, so I call parents in Spanish. I onboard all their kids to the program. Um, I make sure that we have like all their records on data um, on file 
And I also reach out to tutors to make sure that they're, you know, doing our surveys to like record information and stuff like that. I do troubleshooting stuff. So if there's any miscommunication between parents and tutors, I handle that on our Slack channel. Um, I do a little bit of everything and I'm really happy that I'm able to, you know, use my free time to something productive. And I'm just amazed at the amount of hard work that can come together when like people of the community, like, you know, and it's all virtual, it's all online. I'm so impressed with all the amazing work that we're doing because, you know, we're doing it for free and, you know, we should be getting paid. Yes. But it's just amazing to see like what people can do with people power. And I'm just like, so like I'm very grateful to be part of this program. I'm learning so much from my young kids. Um, it's like something that I look forward to in like every part of my day since I do it three days a week. They're so energetic and so, you know, full of uh, personality that I'm just more than happy to teach them things because I remember when I was a young student, I always needed that one-on-one -on -one attention. Um, and my mom always put me in like after school programs that should like keep my mind rolling and stuff like that so i really do think in this time of the pandemic that parents do need the help because you know if you're working how are you supposed to monitor your child's online learning because everything is virtual now so there's like a huge disconnect between you know new york city schools and the, the education that they're receiving um for the students especially young students of color and low-income families and documented families immigrants you know there's a huge disconnect there so i'm very happy that this program is serving um, the people of my community, and I'm really glad that I'm offering all the help that I could give. Absolutely, you know, and I'm, I teach at a college level, and I see the anguish and and the need there, with obviously young adults who are, you know, more prepared for that sort of trauma. But so I can, you know, again dealing with these young kids who are very vulnerable and and uh, needing that mentoring um, and tutoring, how does it work? How do the kids make it to the program? Do they sign up in some way? Uh, just take us through step-by-step step how, how that happens. Sure, so we have several partnerships with uh, different public schools in the area. So they sign up through a form that we share. Uh, we vet our tutors and we do background checks. After we do the background checks, um, we use an online platform uh, for the actual service. Uh, we want to prioritize safety, especially during this time. So either the parent is in the same space uh, with the tutor and all sessions are recorded on the platform that we're using so that we could review what's happening. And after every session, we get a feedback form in order to make sure that all the sessions and the tasks are met. We closely and narrowly define what we're doing as homework help uh, because mm. it is about homework, uh, right? So the parent or guardian sends the homework two days prior to the session, um, and that is what's reviewed. What happens many times in public schools is that there are enrichment programs after school programs that kids would leave and then probably hope work on their homework with. Uh, with some peer tutor, but because of the pandemic and the massive uh, cuts that happened in the Department of Education and other educational programs, so many of those programs were eliminated. So this has been an interesting supplement to many of those programs, but we emphasize that this is a mutual aid program, not necessarily an educational program. Um, it's been an incredible help for families that I'm aware of. Parents, especially the ones that are receiving this, are primarily essential workers, don't have time to sit down and work with the students. The technology is alienating for so many of them. So being able to have someone not only review homework, go through what's available, and also we provide small group sessions that do more sp specialized learning, um, that's been an incredible help for families. We guarantee at a minimum four weeks um, of one hour per week. But because we have so many uh, tutors or volunteer homework helpers, um, we've been providing families with more than four weeks. And our hope is that this model, we're able to package it and just share it um, to the entire world, uh, but also advocating that local government should be doing this. Um, if we saw in New York City, for example, a massive expansion of pre-K uh, brought in many informal daycare providers um, into uh, the pre-K kind of system, was a great jobs program and a great stimulus um, for many folks. And we're hoping that a homework helper model that is funded at the federal and also supported at the local level may do the same. Right. It, as I understand, 
early childhood education has been one of uh, AOC's primary interests early on in her own life. Is that true? Um, and that she uh, was very interested in mentoring and, and presenting children with stories and narratives where they would see themselves also in a more heroic way, more, I guess you could say, enriching, culturally enriching way, as you were touching on before. Would you yeah. be able to touch on that a little bit? The Congresswoman prior to uh, becoming a Congresswoman was um, leading and directing a youth program in the Bronx. Uh, oftentimes people don't mention it, but she does have a background in education. And right. one of the things that is key and that uh, the Congresswoman wants to emphasize is that our curriculum should reflect our highest needs and should reflect our own experiences. Um, that we should be able to not only learn about history, learn about the different things that are in the curriculum, but it should reflect our highest needs um, and our most uh, closest values and desires. So it's interesting to see that while the pandemic has just been ruthless and, and brutal with so many systems and infrastructures in our public education, um, you know, the Congresswoman sees what homework helpers has become um, and a possibility to uh, uh, have curriculum uh, more closely reflect um, what students desires. Um, and her background as an educator definitely informs the development of this program. And Amanda, do you see yourself trying to do that as well in your in your individual tutoring? Um, trying to add a, if you will, a spiritual element, a cultural spiritual element to this. Um, yeah. Yeah, I tutor three children and I always make sure to develop a very close connection with them. So I'm always saying like, how are you feeling today? How are you doing just before we start a lesson so that I could check in with them? Because I feel like if they're not, you know, mentally OK, then, you know, learning is going to be very, very hard for our lesson. So, you know, I've been tutoring um, my fourth grade boy since October. I've been tutoring another little girl since January and my own cousin for the past um, month now. And I love all of them. They're so sweet. I always try to make sure to, like, motivate them, give them positive affirmations. Um, even outside of like the lesson, just constantly, you know, just give them the mindset that they can do whatever they put their mind to. And even if they're struggling in something that they can take that. And if they put all their effort and determination into that, and then they could run and they could succeed in whatever they put their mind to, because I feel like a lot of young students of color don't really get that, you know, and that they don't get that motivation and inspiration. So every time I have my sessions with my kids, even though it's one hour, I always try to like give them all the positive, all the positivity that they need to move forward. And um, I always try to check in with them about how they're doing in school. How are they feeling personally? Because I feel like their mental state and their, um, their academics goes hand in hand. So yeah, I've always like, I love kids. I feel like kids are the future. And if we don't develop a connection with children, then their next batch of society in the future is just going to be out of whack and they're not going to be productive. So I really feel like this program is, you know, sculpting the future. And I'm very happy that we have, you know, the platforms like this to help families of college specifically within the 14th district. And yeah, I love my kids. Like, I hope I can continue. Um, I've been doing past four weeks because I have the time. Um, and I know that all of our tutors give so much effort to what they do. And it's really amazing. I love it. This, this love comes through, this radical love and caring for the other. And look, I, <laughs> the audience, we all know, we have gone through years now of, of trauma and hate and anger and put downs and divisiveness. And it, it, I'm just, it's just so refreshing, so necessary as we attempt to heal as a people and as a world and, and, um, this could make all the difference in the world. I just have to just put that out there. And um, what you're doing is so very, very important. It needs to be so expanded and incorporated into so many of our, not only of our political po programs, but our economic programs, our, our, our cultural programs. You know, I, I, I know that the, the Congresswoman spent a year, uh, I think when she was about 18 or 19, in the Niger and in West Africa. And... And that, as I understand, was a was a, a very radicalizing uh, experience, and the feeling of cooperativeness and caring 
uh, uh, was so prevalent there in this in this culture, and and it's something that's so lacking in ours. So this is a, a program that needs to be expanded. It needs to be a model for so many other things that we need to do in the country. Thank you. So, and, and I agree. And and one of the inspirations to developing the program, uh, a book everyone should pick up. Uh, we make the road by walking uh, with uh, Paola Frieri and and, and Miles Horton. Miles Horton creating the uh, Highlander Institute uh, that focused on popular education and uh, Frieri, who talked about in pedagogy of the oppress of the dialectic model of education. Right. Um, right. In our capitalist system, that is alienating. Um, that is. Uh, creating and industrializing not only children's consciousness um, to be achievement and productive focus, uh, we have to turn away from that. We have to turn to something that is enriching, that is horizontal and dialectic. And that is something that I believe Homework Helpers is doing. Um, one of the interesting things that we're experimenting with is with uh, uh, video games and virtual learning, uh, creating environments where children can shape their own environments and learn within them um, and be able to use these tools uh, to create worlds that reflect their highest aspirations while having people with deep backgrounds in pedagogy and education be able to express and, and help them create these worlds. And what we're seeing is that the pandemic um, you know, in terms of crisis, right, we, we know, like, as we learned through shock doctrine and disaster capitalism, crises is always used uh, by the capitalists to be able to accelerate the neoliberalization of our systems. So this is a way of doing the opposite of that. This is a way of, as opposed to having this hierarchical um, asymmetries between the learner and the giver that all people, um, peer to peer networks, horizontal networks of individuals can not only engage with one another, teach one another, but support one another um, in ways that expands academic intellectual capacity. But I think especially important are social emotional capacity as people have had their mental health really, really, really fragmented um, during these last couple of, of, of months and of this last year during the uh, pandemic and crisis. Absolutely, absolutely. Um, in doing some research on on the show, both of you here, I, Jonathan, your your parents are, are ministers, missionaries. Is that correct? Um, mm -hmm. Did I get that right? So, yeah, there's a certain, um, Amanda, I don't know your folks. The background is there. Is there sort of a, a spiritual um, tradition that you're both sort of following that's given you uh, a sort of um, understanding of your work today? Um, yeah, I'll speak a little bit on that. My mom is a really Christian, so I've always grown up in a Christian household. Um, but she's always instilled the thought of me to like help people and to always offer help to one another just to, you know, to relieve the burden off of your neighbors. And I feel like, you know, we live in a very capitalistic society where it's like, you know, I'm going to do whatever I can to make my money and I'm not going to worry about anybody else. But I think that's a very toxic and detrimental mindset to have, because I think, you know, in a just society, we have to help out our neighbors. We have to help out our children. We have to help out the elderly. We have to help out the working class, immigrants, like everyone. We need to just lend a helping hand to everyone around us because you never know, like, you know, with this pandemic, everybody's suffering. And, you know, my parents have always instilled in me, like, if you have the power you know, use your voice and just use your hands, even if it's like something small and it might not seem like a big deal, like that could mean the world to another person because, you know, maybe somebody's not paying attention to them and that could reach out to children. You know, like with our program, I feel like a lot of people in general kind of overlook young kids and they just kind of dismiss them and just let them do whatever because, you know, they, it is a lot to, you know, handle children, but I think children are the future. And it's like, if we don't, pay close attention to them, then how are we supposed to um, expect this generation of people to go forward and like keep our world going? So I think this program is amazing. And like my mom just always taught me to just like, I've always seen her helping people. Um, so I kind of saw that for myself and I just love the self gratitude that I get knowing that I'm making connections with the people in my community and that I'm helping out other people and that, you know, this could mean so much to them 
And um, even though we're not getting paid, like I don't even mind because I'm making so many meaningful connections with the people in my life that I know I'm helping out their children. I know that I'm helping out families that really, really need the assistance. Um, so I feel like, you know, we need the funding, but I think the work that we're doing is so important that that's primary, like that comes first, that we're reaching families, we're serving people in the community and we're helping children. So yeah, I learned that from my mom. Yeah. Um, and I love kids, like all of my jobs have been with kids my whole life. Um, so when I was presented this opportunity, I was like, yes, I do want to join because, you know, everything has been virtual and remote because of the pandemic and parents were really suffering. And I feel like I couldn't even do my senior year of college online. Like it was hard for me to focus. So I can't even imagine a child you know, being in front of a computer for several hours a day. They probably can't even focus because it was hard for me to focus. And, you know, I'm an adult. So for children, that's even, you know, mag that's magnified even more. So I'm glad that the program is giving this one-on-one -on -one attention to students who really need it. Yeah, your, your mom knows what she's talking about, right? <laughs> and Jonathan, since we're bringing in family here, how about yours? They obviously yeah. created yeah. a very strong young man there who uh, uh, who is using that spirituality, progressive spirituality, which we've talked about a lot in this in this show, the radical magic. The left doesn't talk enough about uh, the the prophetic tradition, uh, and, and, and you know where again, the the most important thing is to love the other and uh, the stranger, if you will. But anyway, would you like to say a few words, Jonathan? Absolutely. And a lot of my spiritual formation uh, happened in, 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 in spaces that were oppressive uh, and spaces that were liberative. Uh, my parents were ministers and, and being in both spaces, um, you saw the, 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 the strong value of collectivity and community when faith and spirituality was expressed in, in, in collective form. And you saw the alienation and the isolation um, and the condemnation when it was expressed in individual form. And I experienced that deeply. So growing up after experiencing both, both of those spaces, um, you know, my analysis was really shaped by a lot of liberation theology. Uh, yeah. So one of the core tenets and, and one of the prime motives of, of liberation theology is to look at the, op the preferential option for the poor. Um, and when you, when I read scripture through that lens, um, and I define myself as spiritual, not necessarily Christian now, but I think as a perennialist, um, I believe there's a little bit of, 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 of divinity and of that mutuality that expresses itself in different faith traditions. Um, you know, it's the idea of the last need to, needing to become first. Um, and in our society, it's very clear that the 99% of the vast majority of people, their needs have a place last, and we need that inversion. Um, and that inversion um, of, of making every mountain turning into a molehill, uh, being able to go ahead and understand that we need to prioritize um, those that have been set aside. That's been incredibly not only fruitful in my work and activism, but it shapes a lot of the work and activism of people that are in these spaces. Uh, so, you know, again, going back to like in Latin American liberation theology, a lot of it also informed by Paolo Freire, uh, but we have like Gustavo, um, we have a lot of uh, liberationists um, that seeded a lot of these uh, struggles. And if we look at scripture also, um, we looked at the role of the prophet, right? Um, being outside of the state and condemning the state, being outside of the state and condemning the king. Um, and speaking truth to power, even to the extent of their own death and even to the extent of, of peril, uh, because, you know, we have to have justice uh, flow like a waterfall and, and be able to Absolutely. bring down any empire. So that's been incredibly not only instructive in my own um, experience, but I think that now, now you see more of the left understanding and realizing it, whether it's mystical sub, uh, traditions um, of like Sufism that has this radical understanding. A lot of, um, for example, like voodoo, right? Uh, it's incredibly demonized, but voodoo was an, a very important part of Haitian revolutionary action and activity um, that led to the Fleurs revolution of, 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 of people who are black overthrowing um, the oppressive um, imperial uh, uh, influence of France at that time. So I think, yes, the left should talk more about spirituality and understand its roots 
um, and liberative movements, not only in politics and culture, uh, but also in society. Absolutely. Fascinating. I, I noticed also in your resume, Johnson, it was a connection to Union Theological Seminary uh, for a couple of years or so, and then and the Bronx Clergy Roundtable. Um, and of course, um, I'm a sociologist, but I sat in on a number of courses, mainly Cornell West courses when he was teaching. He'll be back teaching courses on Bonhoeffer. And so, anyway, make a long story short, James Cohn, of course, taught there for many, many years. Black liberation theology. So again, um, as you point out, um, representing and working with the Congresswoman who has mentioned in her own background, this, this progressive secular, uh, I'm sorry, progressive spiritualism, she uses the term non-attachment um, mm. in her own work. I wonder if either one of you can talk a little about that. What that means in terms of your own commitment, your own mission, um, your own spirituality here. It's not about a job. It's not about, you know, being a higher status and so on. So uh, well, if you could explain that a little better, that would be wonderful for our audience. Yeah, I could talk a little bit on that. I think it's just, I mean, I said this before, but I think it's so important to like make connections with people. And I think during this pandemic, you know, a lot of people were alone. Like we were in quarantine, we were inside the house and, um, you know, mental health is so important, especially within communities of color. And I feel like I already said this before, but just helping out one another is extremely important. And to just make connections with people that you probably never even thought that you would get along with. But if you reach out to people, you never know like the conversation and the connections that can come out of those relationships. And then, you know, relating it back to the program, I just think that like, you know, this is somewhat off topic related. I always call parents in Spanish um, because I'm in charge of that. And we have a lot of students from Jackson Heights and Queens. Um, and that's a predominantly like, uh, Colombian and Venezuela neighborhood and I call all the parents and they're always like you know thank you so much for calling me because I can't even communicate with my teacher because I don't speak English and you know there's a huge disconnect and you know this phone call means so much to me because it's a lot that I'm going to have a tutor who speaks my language who speaks Spanish so they can connect with my child that I can talk to them and talk to them about whatever it is that my student is struggling with in school and you know those conversations mean so much to me and they make me like you know, I, I feel sad on one hand because it's, you know, it's really bad that they don't have that help and support, but I'm really happy to give that support to them and to make sure that, like, I'm a point of contact, that they can reach me whenever, um, just in case they have any questions or concerns, and that we have tutors who speak the language that will connect with them. Um, and I think that's just a really important thing because I think specifically within the Bronx and Queens and just New York City in general, it's like, if you don't speak the language, then there's a huge disconnect there. So it's like, how are we supposed to fight for the people and vouch for the people with no voice, that there's no one to speak for them? So I think this program is just great because we're able to offer people to speak. You know, we have tutors who speak Bengali, English, Spanish, Mandarin, Chinese. Like, it's so it's really vast. And I think that's amazing that we can connect with so many people. And I think that connection there is just great. And I know that all of our tutors are putting in so much hard work. We have such a great team of organizers too, that we all work so well virtually online. You know, we've never even met in person, but like, I'm just so amazed at the work that we can put together um, remotely and virtually through a computer. Um, and it's great. So I really just love those connections that we're making with our families and our students. And I really think that these kids are, and these kids and their families are gonna remember this forever. You know, like in the future, when we think about the pandemic, they're going to think, you know, this program was helping out my child or, you know, this program is helping out my family because my student is able to do better in their classes. And if my student does better in their classes, this can open up doors for them in their future. So I think, yeah. That was Absolutely. Yeah. No, incredible. So well put. Um, I'm, I'm curious, are you also both of you aware of what the Panthers and Young Lords attempted to do back in the 60s and 70s. And uh, how yeah. do you relate to that? Yeah, I'm actually a member of the um, New Era Young Lords. <laughs> okay. Um, yeah, so I always go to the People's Church um, 
whatever days that are free throughout the week and we give out like uh meals to the community like free meals of whoever's in harlem um, but I know within the 60s and 70s, they were the ones, or it was like the Black Panthers and the Young Lords, they were the ones who initiated, you know, giving free meals, um, free breakfast meals to students. And I just learned that a few years ago and I was like, I didn't even know that. I thought that that was just like something that was funded by the government. But, you know, that's what shows that it takes people of the community to promote radicalized change. And then they can fight for the working class and for immigrants and for people of color, like Black and Brown families. Like, it really shows what can happen when people band together and use people power. So I'm a big fan. <laughs> power to the people. Absolutely. Well, as you'll see, uh, I've, I've kept a, a five, six-minute clip on the history of the, of the Young Lords in, in the show. that you'll be um, Again, I wanted to mention that term uh, that Congresswoman sometimes talks about, non-attachment, to be non-attached people can easily not know what that means. It's not that you're not involved, but maybe, Jonathan, you, you can comment on that. What does, what does she mean by that? And how does that relate to your own, um, you know, involvement in, in organizing? Yeah, yeah. And I think you're referring to an amazing conversation that Congresswoman had with uh, Cornell West, yeah. I, I believe. And, you know, I... I can't speak specifically to the congressman's understand congresswoman's uh, understanding of the term, uh, but from what I recall and the way I, I I I use it in my own life is is yeah I think our society conditions us especially under capitalism to be achievement based and to focus on destination, um, and I think for me it's focusing on enrichment and direction. So what is the direction that I'm going to and not necessarily the destination. Uh, when we're so focused on outcome, um, when we're so focused on where we have to go, we become alienated from the present. Um, and we know that capitalism has a very interesting relationship with time um, and that it tries to dislodge you from the present. It tries to push you away from the here and now. And the thing is that the only thing that matters in many ways is are the relationships that we're able to do now the, uh, the 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 engagements and the and the feelings and the the way we're expressing in solidarity and action uh, the way we can engage now. So I think that the interesting way of viewing non-attachment, right, and a lot of Eastern and, and a lot of like Buddhist thinking um, and and tradition um, points to this. The way I try to practice in my life and my service is that in spite of what the outcome may be, uh, we have to focus on right feeding our neighbor, connecting with our neighbor now. One of the things I always used to tell in my house of worship uh, in the past is that I never remember Jesus or any of the amazing spiritual leaders going to a person that was hungry and said, hey, I don't necessarily have food for you right now, but you're going to have heaven in the future. No, they were fed. Jesus didn't go to uh, the person that was um, couldn't walk or was um, injured and said, hey, you know, I can't deal with your situation right now. However, um, here's something for the future. No, Jesus wasn't attached um, to a future outcome, but making the person whole in this moment. And we must thrust ourselves into making people whole in the present. And I think that non-attachment allows us to view the person as they are at this moment. And that is a key element of service. Um, many of our relations are conditioned um, to an attachment of what that person can return to me in the future or in the immediate future, as opposed to being uh, attached uh, to the present. So in our capitalist, alienating, uh, 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 a system that manipulates time, we're attached uh, to an outcome in the future as opposed to being attached to what we can do in the here and the now. So I think that for me, a spiritual practice of non-attachment is that, is not necessarily focusing on the destination, but in the direction that I can take at this moment, at this time, uh, to serve our neighbors in need. And that forms uh, not only the nexus and the basis of what we've done um, with homework helpers, but also with many other um, beautiful, amazing mutual aid projects um, that have been flourishing throughout the country through many different amazing people, um, not only the past year, seeing this in my experience in Puerto Rico after the hurricane, seeing this in the vast movement in the 60s and 70s, 
Um, so not attachment from outcome, um, but it, so we could attach ourselves to serving people now. That's the way I interpret it. Absolutely. No, very true. Um, now, the also, I think what Cornell was getting at, too, in part, agreeing with you, is the warning to of the, of the normal commodification, the buying of people. Uh, everything and, and the easiness of selling out and selling oneself for a, 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 a bowl of pottage, as he puts it. Um, so well put. Um, listen, in the in the minute that we still have left, um, tell us how we can reach you, how people in the audience can connect. Um, doesn't have to be in the 14th uh, district, correct? Tell us how we can get in touch with you and further this uh, unbelievable program. We have a link, very short and simple. I'll spell it out. It is uh, bit.ly backslash homework helpers NYC. Again, if you want to sign up a student or if you want to learn more, we have all our contact information. The link is spelled out, B as in boy, I as in igloo, T as in Tom, dot L as in language, why um, backslash homework helpers and why and Amanda, uh, thank you so very, very much. Uh, it's good to see a sociology major, anthropology and Latin American studies getting into something. Uh, we're not talking about MBAs here now. We're, we're talking about people who are really devoting themselves to a vocation, to a mission. And that's what I think uh, I'll be about. Uh, the time has flown. I really wish we could go on. I want to have you both back again. Thank you so very, very much for telling our audience and explaining this incredible, exciting program. Uh, God bless you both. Take care and uh, yeah. hope to see you very soon again. Thank you. Thank you. And Take thank care. you for watching us here this week on the Radical Imagination. This is Jim Bretos. We'll see you again next week on the radical imagination. This land is your land.
Yeah, 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 yeah.